on some of the problems, some of the problems that go on with why the organization of the church, the gathering of the church, the ethos of the church isn't working. So that's what this conversation is about today. And I just, I just want to talk about something for you strategically as you look at the new year. And so the thought for me is um, what we're about to talk about is not your fault. What we're about to talk about is actually centuries old. Go back to the second century, third century, fourth century, as we begin to see a problem emerging. But the problem comes into your world as a pastor, small group leader, as a leader, infesting the local community you call your church. And it's decimating something that we call discipleship. And that matters a lot. So that's kind of the picture I want to paint for you in the next few minutes. I want to give you just a few statistics to set the stage for how I come to think about this, and perhaps it'll help you think about it as well. And and um, we'll get to a Q&A here pretty quickly. So I, I hope I don't put anybody to sleep. Let's, let's talk about some things you can see on the outside. One of the research areas we look at is religiosity. It's a sociological study about how people think about religion and how they participate in religion. This graph we could talk about for a long time, but I want you to think about the area in the late 90s going through 2012. The study was recently updated to bring it to 2019, but the trend's down, big time down, like unprecedented down. And this is a sociologically, mathematically scholarly model. Several studies with Pew and Barnum have done the same thing, very similar results. Religiosity, the way we in America view Christianity is sloping off fast. Let me show you another thing. Let's convert this into numbers of the church. Who's walked out of the church? Our research said 38 million between 2000, uh, 1972 and 2019 have walked out of the church, 72 to 2019. If any of you've read uh, uh, Jim Davis, Michael Graham's book, The Great Dechurching, recently, that book said the number now is actually 40 million. They brought it up to 2021. So a lot of people are exiting. And a rise, obviously, in uh, nothings, the nuns, agnostics, and atheists. Inside the sanctuary, though, I want you to see this. This is really important for us. We've watched the back door, seeing people go out the door. Very challenging. But inside the sanctuary, something's going on. And what should be kind of running through your mind to hope at this moment is, what's going on? Is, is something wrong? The nuns and the duns for the millennials, for the Gen Zs, and to a lesser degree, the X generation. So I think basically sort of... 55 and down, 60% of the people who started out in the church, grew up in the church, have walked out of the church. 60%, 6 out of 10. For the people who are left, take a look at some of these other statistics. In the middle of the chart is this word inert. 8 out of 10 people still in the pews have no fellowship, no Bible study, no small group, and they attend your church 1.7 times a month. That's the national average. Now, as I'm talking through these statistics, you may say, well, that's not my church. Well, what I'm really trying to suggest is this is a national average. A lot of great research houses have done this look. And while some of these may not apply to you, all of these in some degree or another, if you really watch your numbers closely, probably do. Not my job. Over the far left side of the screen, 35% of the people in the pews say, talking about Christ isn't my job description. It belongs to you guys, the pastors and the leaders. Over here on the right, unable and unwilling to be evangelical. It's something that I just don't know how to do. I'm not equipped to do it. I come, I listen to the sermons. I get my latte. I get concierge Christianity. I get this hit. It's great. It's wonderful. Then I go home. Four out of 10 people in the pews think Jesus is one of many in the way to heaven. Jesus, among other gods. Lower left-hand corner, four out of 10, stay out of my life. It's solo Christianity. I do what I do by myself. This is the way people think. Lower right-hand corner, mute on the good news, 92%. So say the numbers as you watch these traffic patterns. Say, I have not for at least a year, and the average is more toward five years, ever talked about the gospel of Christ. So that's going on inside the sanctuary. This is the population in general, the demeanor and the style, the people in the pews in your churches. If we stack those over to the right side, the message that we're trying to suggest to you is that discipleship's been hacked, but it was hacked a long time ago. 
This is what you're up against. We're trying to say, here's what's going on. So let's take a Petri dish and let's call this your local church culture. The church are individual believers gathering communities of local churches, which then make up the church. I want to show you, as we move away from those symptoms on the right, these three pieces on the right are really symptoms, what causes we're suggesting you're facing? What kind of pressure points are trying to get into this Petri dish and are influencing the people who are in your congregations? Here's one. Going back all the way to the third century, one of the predominant problems that you face today is optional lordship. I want to get saved, but this idea of surrender to Jesus Christ, don't want it. Another one we call catch and release. Now, this is the evangelical mindset. You can think about the Lausanne Conference, and you can run it forward. Don't blow a gasket when I say this, but the whole idea is we want to go catch people for Jesus, take the hook out, toss them in the water, move on, catch the next one, catch and release. Very, very evangelical, but we essentially orphan and abandon the people who are coming to Christ. That's the predominant trend to the tune of between about 85%, some research suggests, who become believers, who are dumped up to 97%. Just depends on the studies you look at. Power is a really big problem in the church. It has influenced for a long time. We went all the way back to Constantine to show this thing moving forward. But as you see the church trying to have influence over its society, over governments, over local communities, as well as the nation, power becomes brand, influence, and coercion in many cases. And this begins to animate the thinking of the people who are in the pews with you. Clericalism is a big problem. Now, clericalism, just to explain this from my point of view, is the idea that no liturgy is without a license. If you're not a licensed pastor, you have no right to say anything or to do anything. This creates two problems. One, the people in the pews go, hey, great, I'm here for the sermon. You guys up on stage, you take care of all the big problems. You bury the in-laws, right? You take care of the baptisms. You do all the heavy praying, and you answer all the questions when we bring people who don't know who Jesus is in the door. The other problem is we load you. We load you up. We expect you to carry the ball in every area. You do everything. You answer everything. You take care of everything. Your employees, that's what you do. Clericalism is a real problem facing the church. We borrow this phrase, herd community, from the coronavirus. The idea of herd community, this is a this is a tremendous problem in the church today. If we slosh around 10 or 100 or 1,000 people in a room long enough, disciples emerge from that convocation, herd community. That is not biblical, but it's a real problem facing the church today. And then this one probably comes as close to your world as executive pastors as any, the not main things. We want to convert you from the leadership and the mission that you're called to into managers dealing with metrics. Now, as a CEO, I'm all into, I need a plan. I need budgets. I need the ability to look forward and through things. But when we start distracting leaders into becoming simply managers, we really wreck the way the mission of the church is going to be executed. So what this all results in is institution-centric Christianity. A lot of churches start out with a vision. We have a vision. We know what we want to do. Then we think about how we want to worship. We think about the kind of ministries that we want to produce. We talk about how we do community. We think about, is it small groups, large groups? How do we do cell groups? How do we do family groups and so on? How do we grow? Or do we even want to grow? Some churches don't want to grow. They want to be a very tight-knit group. Some people want as many people as they can get. How do we grow? And then we get to the third ring, attendance. How many people are flowing through here? We've got to watch these metrics. Building an OPEX. How do I support the capital infrastructure that I have? Do I have the cash flow to survive? And what's my brand? What makes me different? How do I work? This becomes very institution-centric. And if you look at this, this is a very, very common model, and it gets foisted on you as pastors and leaders make this model work. Now, that doesn't fit with the idea of a mathete, mathete, as I say in the Greek, right? This is where the word discipleship comes from. And the word doesn't actually mean just simply disciple. It means your progress and the progress of people around you as a New Testament follower surrendered of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I'm going to put 
some pieces on this wheel just to show you some basic concepts that we talk about in, when we try to present this idea. The book is not about discipleship. The book is about leadership facing up to these problems. But here's sort of a full picture, I think, I would argue from the New Testament. People are invited to follow. Disciples, not yet believers, that may blow your gasket, invited to follow. People who then believe after evaluating who is Christ and surrender to him. People being pulled into a community. People beginning to learn. People beginning to understand what is lordship. What is sanctification? This is where it gets interesting. People who are personally mentored. People who have wingmen. We're going to talk about that in just a minute. And then this last piece, go, make, and invite. But I want to show you what we see in the research based on the things we've already shown you and the conversations we have. This is what modern Western discipleship looks like. We invite a lot of people to come and see. We really don't understand the ideas of surrender so well today in the West. Community and ministry, we do really well. Learning, we got some of those wonderful pastors like you who can preach and teach great online resources. It's wonderful. But Western discipleship, statistically, when you look at it, when you listen to people talking, don't understand lordship, lesser so sanctification. They don't have mentors. They don't have wingmen. We're going to talk about that in a minute. And this idea of going making, inviting, and then it's a rinse, repeat. This is modern Western discipleship. So what I want to put on the table is for leadership, as you think about the next year, about where you're going, about what you're trying to do, the only way, that sounds terribly out exclusive, right? But the only way that a church culture can truly pursue discipleship is if leadership intentionally shapes that culture. And that has to be the mission. So this again might blow some gaskets and we can Q&A this in a minute, but the mission of the church is not to save souls. The mission of the church is to make disciples. That's who we are. That's what we do. And if we're not doing that biblically, well, then we've evolved into something we thought Jesus must have overlooked, but it doesn't work well. And it takes us back to that brand centric model we talked about a minute ago. Do you understand your mission as an individual, which is also the same mission for your church and for the church? Do you then shape culture so that when you're not around, people get that mission? They chase that mission. Every decision you make, everything you do is driven from the mission. The culture reinforces that. And then we have the individual coming alive as disciples. That's the direction. And that rinses and repeats and goes back and forth again. It's constant mission, constant culture, constant emphasis on individuals. All the performance metrics that you have to talk about, they're important, but they're outside the circle of the mission of the church. So in kind of this wrap up, so we can get to Q&A, the question is, now what? Dennis, you've thrown all these stats at us. It looked kind of gloomy. You talked about the causes. They look kind of weird. And then you started throwing up all this stuff about, well, we got to get back to the mission. How dare you say that that's our mission? Culture, what in the world are you talking about? And then how do I do that with individual people? If you think about the things that we were missing in that wheel diagram that have been thrown off or broken off, we have to attack the crisis as leaders. If you don't attack it, Statistically, you drop your discipleship in the biblical definition down to about 3 to 4% of the people that come through your church. Do you have the right mission? Do you understand then how to influence a church culture? And here's where it gets really personal, folks. And I really hope you'll let me haunt you with this one. You have to go first. If you don't get what we're about to talk about right here, it'll never stick as a culture. Nobody will ever get the mission. The church will keep on doing churchianity, not Christianity. This is my favorite set of airplanes, the F-15. I don't care about all the other airplanes in the universe. This is the greatest fighter that's ever lived, and I just absolutely love this ride. I've got it set up with three folks here. There's a lead, there's wingmen, and then there is somebody following, somebody coming along behind. Do you have a mentor and a discipler, somebody that you can you could call. Uh, the, the joke that we talk about is, do you have any 2 a.m. Waffle House friends? Now, for those of you who don't know what a Waffle House is, a Waffle House in the eastern U.S., kind of like maybe an IHOP, is a um, little 
pancake house that's open 365 days a year, 24 hours a day. It never closes, right? Do you have any 2 a.m. Waffle House friends? People you can call at two in the morning and say, meet me at Waffle House, bring a shovel, don't ask questions. And those people will be there for you. They will show up. Do you have one? Have you ever been discipled is a question we want to ask. Don't take that as a shame point. Just take it as a question. Have you ever been discipled? If not, we want to talk about that. Do you have any wingmen? Do you have one or two? I don't mean 12. I mean one or two. Do you have one or two who really know you? They know your warts as well as your wonderfuls. Do you really have wingmen? And then are you inviting anybody else to come and see, to come along? This is the beginning of leadership. You go first. Then can you focus people on the mission, the mission of discipleship that Jesus gave us? Matthew 28, 19 makes it really, really plain. The local church culture follows if you focus on that mission as a leader. And when you start doing this mentor, wingman, follower idea, you begin to build slowly. This is not a microwave pizza, that world that we talk about, which is discipleship. That may be the fastest I've ever had to walk through this model, but there you go. So website's up. You'll see more about that later. I'll, I'll do the stop share and uh, turn it back over to you, Kevin, to moderate. Thank you, Dennis. Okay, th that that's a lot. We got we're, we're sharing a lot, and so um, I'm gonna open up. You know, questions on the chat. I'm gonna invite uh, my friend Tramel to also lead us in in this discussion. Questions. So, jump on in, Tramel. Yeah. First of all, Dennis, thank you so much. Um, I'm kind of fanboying because I read your book early last year. Uh, and I started the journey of planting a church here in Dallas. So thank you so much for wow. um, just the thoughts, the challenges. Um, man, as a church planner, it challenges me to make sure that our vision and mission is very clear as far as making disciples that make disciples. So first question, and then we're going to, you know, again, I'm just going to kick out a question to you guys, and then we'll open it up for more questions as you write down thoughts. But um, one thing I heard you say, Dennis, that I think was really key is that our, our personal, as leaders, discipleship process is uh, it's actually way more important than the people that we are discipling. And so um, just to open up the conversation uh, for all of us, what were some key things in your faith journey as far as people that poured into you and discipled you that's made you who you are today? What's some core things, some key things in your personal disciples of journey uh, that's made you who you are today? The, the most important thing, and this has just been a repeat theme for me, starting early on in my faith and having somebody who was my, my leader, my mentor, is they weren't trying to hide the warts. They lived with me and they said, here's my life. I could see what was going on at home. I could hear what was going on in their heads. I heard some ugly, weird things, right? And this was a wonderful, wonderful pastor who I loved and respected, and he was real. He let me see him. He let me see his deliberations and his thinking. That, to me, was, in, was just amazing. But secondly, for two years, he just walked alongside me. He wrote me letters when I wasn't in town. He called me on the phone. He just asked how I was doing. And if I asked for advice, I got it. But otherwise, we just walked together and I saw a guy following Christ with all his heart, mind, soul, and strength. That to me is so core and it's contagious. So the core lesson is be real. Don't try to be perfect. Make some time with these people and then expect them to do the same thing with more people. Expect that to go forward. That's really, really important. And that's the multiplication process for leaders. A, if I flip it to the institutional side of the core question, it is you are in a better position than anybody else to start pairing up a few people who really want to do this, who don't even maybe know each other, but you know them, you can see them. We don't pair people up. And we don't walk alongside people and we're not real with people. Those would be my three thoughts. Powerful. Thank you so much for that. I'm going to open it up for more questions. Uh, more questions would be great. So if you have a question for Dennis, uh, we have a few moments. So we'll take a few questions. Uh, go ahead and come off uh, mute and uh, shoot the question to, to Dennis. 
uh, Dennis, I really appreciate this. I'm uh, I'm a little frustrated because I have got my whiteboard right here, and I pretty much have that first slide uh, up there as far as like our planning for the year goes. And so I'm I'm looking at this. I'm saying, okay, um, I've got a team. I've got a team of mostly younger, um, minist- mostly younger ministry team. They'll they'll be on board with whatever the changes that we say. Hey, we want to make some structural changes to how we plan and implement and what we do. Um, and you kind of answer my my question of what the first step is um, with doing it ourselves, with the discipleship ourselves uh, as as the modeling. But how do we how do we make that transition from an old model to if we're calling this a new model? Um, what, what are some <clears throat> realities for time frame and how we communicate that and how we put that into action? Is this something like, Hey guys, today we're doing this, like from, from today, from now on, we're, you know, we're completely flipping things. Or is this something that we should expect to take, you know, X amount of months or it depends on the size or, or what can you speak into there for making that transition from that first model to the second? Great question, DJ. The, um, the answer I give you goes with the, it's depends, right? Because we've got to think about the different personalities of different churches. In some cases you can walk in the door cause you got so much lightning in your, in your bloodstream. People go like, whatever you say, we're completely on board. We'll do it. We got it. Right. A church plant might have a tremendous amount of leverage to say, folks, we're making a good 40-degree turn with the rudder, and we're doing it right now. We're going in this direction. If you're in a mature, larger church and you walk in, you could find yourself dead the next day trying to pull off something like that, right? So so, so that's one piece of the puzzle. Here's my general advice. I hate the word general and this sort of a thing, but let me just try this out with you. Do you have a wingman who is really with you in the commitment that this is the mission and this is the way we should go. If you don't have a wingman, my advice to you is back off and go renegade, do it stealth, start, start an insurrection in your church. That's a very sensitive word to use these days, but Hey, think about the idea of starting an insurrection with one or two who believe and can run alongside you. If you want to try to make the public play for this, Probably the worst strategy most of us can infect is to walk in and go, I have a fatwa, I am the imam, here's the way it's going to be, Allah Akbar, we're going to go this way. That's probably not going to get you very far in a community of Christians who don't even understand what discipleship's all about. However, comma, if you begin modeling a beautiful, fantastic, warts and all life with one or two, and a few of those people are like, hey, man, you won't believe what DJ is doing for me right now. This is amazing, right? This is absolutely game changing simply because we're going through life together, right? Now we start making a difference with a few. Don't worry. Jealousy and greed will bring a lot of traffic to the page for you. Did I say that in a really terrible way? No, that I, I think that's it. That, well, first of all, that resonates a lot. I appreciate that. That's uh I, we're in a, our unique position. I haven't typed into the chat yet is, um, so I'm, I'm the last of the founding pastors of our church. Mm-hmm. Um, we launched about 12 years ago and our lead pastor stepped down, uh, back in June. We just hired a new guy who has been coming on Sundays and then they're finalizing their move down here this week. And so a lot of people are looking at me to kind of set the tone for what comes next and but our discussions are with our new lead pastor are very much trying to figure out the balance of how much do we want to shift things immediately with the new guy um and and how (laughs) trying to because um I think very wisely he he's one who's like, Hey, we're not trying to like completely overhaul everything tomorrow, which I would probably try and do. Uh, uh. <laughs> <laughs> but um, it, it's trying to, and I think he's on board too. Um, he, he'd be on board with that too. I think the big thing for us is how do we, so, so we model that, but how do we, 
how do we teach that while we're modeling that i guess is the the net the follow-up to that question i don't i don't want to steal everybody's time but just kind of wanted to throw that out there as well every time i step into a broken organization and every time i talk to churches about this situation that dj is raising i i really try to emphasize this point first of all dj to your specific point with your new guy showing up i really really would encourage if i were on your board taxi in close to this person really sort out the mission what really truly honestly is the mission because if new guy comes in going like well the mission is vanilla and chocolate donuts on sundays and everybody has a happy meal and we do our sermon we go home you know a declaration is not going to go very far on the flip side once you synchronize mission in his heart your heart in this you go forward broken organizations and i'm not attacking anybody's church here i'm talking about business as well as church the script over and over again is broken organizations lost their mission. If you don't get the mission right, you can't do anything else. You can't even get wingmen to come alongside you because there's nothing to go alongside on. The scaffolding begins with the mission. And as you walk and talk this, this process that I'm talking about, this is not gonna, this is not gonna be good on the hip parade, guys, but this is a two to five year walk. Culture change with a new mission is a two to five year walk. And if you're really going to be good, if you were one of my chief operating officers in a corporation I run or in some of the churches I've been involved with, one of the things I tell you is you have got to be talking the mission and building this culture every single day of your life for two years before you can even hope traction is beginning to build with people who are there. But the biblical model of Christ was just like that, two, three years of pouring into people's lives, slow change, but this is strategic. So building this up in your church, I think has to begin with, do we have the mission right? And until you do, nothing else is going to work. That's great, Dennis. <clears throat> DJ, great question. Great, great question, man. Um, hopefully you get you were able to get some insight from Dennis and uh, I'm sure that uh, at the end we'll get information from Dennis to continue the conversation. So we got we got time for about two more questions, two more questions. And so just go, go ahead and come off the mute and shoot the question to Dennis um, so we can get some feedback from him. I have a question or a follow up to something Dennis just said <laughs> um, about the process of knitting hearts with the pastor, well, between the key pivotal positions. I think that's a process that most people are trying to avoid um, because in, in my eyes, I feel like it sounds scary. It can get messy and <laughs> maybe a rumble and, and a tumble on the floor. I don't know, <laughs> but can you speak to that process a little bit? Um, um, maybe like, you know, three points or five points um, to just kind of initiate that process. Nikki, that's fabulous because you're going right to the heart of what I think is the disciple dilemma. We don't want to be known in the West. We mm -hmm. want to be the lone wolf who needs nothing doing just what we do. Mm -hmm. And this is where it really comes alive for all of us. When we begin to realize that the idea of meaning and purpose and identity and belonging emerge only if I'm known. Otherwise, we're just talking to a facade, to a mass, to nothing. Mm -hmm. And the only way people are ever going to get this, sorry, I'm throwing this back at you guys, but you're on the Zoom call, until we're willing to be honest about who we are and the troubles that we have, you'll never be known and nobody else will ever believe you. They will never believe you. When I can walk into a corporation and say to a thousand people, I'm the dumbest guy in the room. And by the way, I'm impulsive. My wife will tell you I've got ADHD to the max. And I just stumble through life making a lot of bad choices. But we're going to go turn this organization around because here's the mission. People just come to the door and go like, I want on. I want in. I want to be a part of that. And your, your point then is, Nikki, beautiful, which is we've got to knit 
our heart to some people. And just because we're only going to be along with them for, I'm going to suggest a year or two or three, doesn't mean they're not still part of my life. I've got so many mentors in my life, so many wingmen in my life who I don't see every day, but I can pick that phone up anytime and bring them alive. And then they will reach out to the other people in the community and they'll say, you got to come check this out. This is an encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ through Nikki. This is amazing. That's so crucial for us to be known. Thank you for that. Thank you. I have to sit in it for a minute. <laughs> mm. Can we all just say, say throw a hardball? Somebody's got to throw a hardball. Hard this, these yeah. have been really nice, easy this, ones. This is a lot for just one cup of coffee. So. Right, right, right. Can we just say, <laughs> say loud? That's that's wow. That's that's uh. So we don't want we don't want to move past this moment for you know too fast. But is it anyone has one last question? pertaining to what we're kind of already in, um, that would be, that would be awesome. Um, don't feel shy. Just go ahead and jump in. I'm going to go kind of super practical a little bit. Um, I think right now, uh, and I could be completely missing things, but I, I feel like the church, including our community, uh, is really um, idolizes and like emphasizes um, efficiency uh, with how we do, I mean, systems and processes are great. I love, I love system process. That's my role. I love it so much. Um, but everything I'm hearing and feeling that we're, we're talking about just is really inefficient. Um, like my journey of, of, uh, somebody pouring into my life, discipleship was a very inconvenient thing. Like this dude went out of his way, poured life and energy into me and, and, and pursued, uh, uh, pursued me in a really real way in order for me to go after it. So uh, what are some of the models that you've seen just from a very like organizational standpoint of, of, of this working? What have you seen actually work in church context? Joe, I think the, the, the quick answer to this would be, first of all, thank all of you for your service. I know you guys are in combat duty doing what you do. I know it's tough being a pastor, really tough. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for what you do. I want you to separate your life into two chunks for a minute. We're going to do the guy thing. We're going to silo. Here we go. We're going to silo. One silo is my day-to-day -day vocational work in my church. I want you to be the manager. I want you to be the administrator. I want you to be the efficiency expert, and I want you to operate in that world in whatever way you're called and whatever way you believe is important. But what I want you to do now is I want you to look at the second silo. And that second silo is this. Every single one of us, whether you work in my world, your world, whatever world you work in, alongside that in an incredibly human way, which has nothing to do with efficiency, we have the duty, the call by our Lord, our Savior, Jesus Christ, to go into the world to follow him, not veering to the left or to the right, as the Old Testament says, pursuing him with all of our hearts, surrendering, and then beginning to invite others to come along on the walk and the ride. That's off hours. Sometimes it'll happen during work hours. You'll get the phone call. You'll get somebody walking in the door. But who is the one or two with you that you're living that messy life Nikki mentioned a few minutes ago that you're living? And that's outside the context of work. And that's what all of us do. Be efficient, be effective, be a systems engineer. This is fantastic. However, comma, stop putting activity-based costing on the role of being a follower of the Most High God who is bringing wingmen along and people in trail as followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. Do that, then go back to your efficiency model and promote that and let people see that exploding in your world. That's so important. Does that make sense the way I went with that, Joe? Did I touch it? Yeah, that was great. Thank you so much, Dennis. Wow. Wow. Well, let's let's give Dennis a hand clap, guys. Come on. Let's give him a phenomenal hand clap. Thank you so much. Seriously, but to, to hear you live and not just read your book is even more amazing. Uh, you lit my heart on fire. And so I want I want to leave before I pass it over back over to Kevin um or Joe. Um this last question for us to think about in our context of ministry. And here's the question. Uh, what's the answer to making disciples that make disciples in your church context? What's the answer? 
to making disciples that make disciples in your church context. And so that, I think that's something that we can kind of chew on uh, for a while there. And uh, again, I'm going to kick it back over to Kevin or to Joe uh, to finish us off. Yeah, thank, thank you, Tramel, for leading this. Dennis, thank you so much for hanging out with us and just challenging us in this space, especially at the beginning of the year, uh, making sure we're aligned to the main mission of God's church. And so um, one of the, I want to, as we transition to our time of prayer and, um, you know, as again, as what we do here with Coffee Break is, again, it's a safe space for us in, in ministry, especially after, um, you know, a busy weekend and being, you know, us pouring into into people and getting prepared for another week uh, or basically getting prepared for Sunday or weekend services um, and, and not taking a moment, a break to be poured into. And so thank you, Dennis, for pouring into us. Um, equipping us, inspiring us, encouraging us, and reminding us about why we do this and why and what's the main what's the main focus. Before we trans as we transition into a time of of just allowing ourselves to support each other, um, I'm gonna open up and if you have any prayer requests, any things that um, that's challenging in your in your personal life, maybe in ministry, um, we want to take a moment for us to pray for each other. Um, we see we see it as an example in discipleship as prayer, you know, in Acts 2, 42 is that they were gathering, they were gathering regularly, they were gather, they were coming around um the apostles' teachings, but also they were praying, they were praying with each other, and we saw the early church grow from that space, um, praying with thanksgiving, prayer with, with supplication all of that and seeing seeing the move of God move and so in your so here's what I what I'll do is if you have any prayer requests feel free to put it in the chat um or open up and, you know open up and share you know turn on uh, unmute yourself and share but we want to just take a moment to um come alongside each other in prayer requests or praise reports um I think you know, it's it's also important to celebrate what God is doing. One of the as as you're thinking through and, and sharing, here's one thing I wanted to ha quickly highlight. Nikki kind of talked through the knitting of hearts with with our XP with our senior pastor and working through that, and and it just kind of brought me to a place of reality. Man, we live in. Um, I, I'll say I'll say for myself. I think I live in a place, especially in ministry, where Sunday is set up or anything we do is really set up for excellence, right? We're looking to, to present something in excellence. But here's, um, based off of what Dennis was kind of highlighting, I felt like God just showed me this. Here's the issue in regards to working and and creating something in excellence from, from man's perspective is that it becomes something that's a presentation and it's a performance. And when you have performance and presentation together, what ends up happening, it takes away from the place of authenticity and, and room for messiness, right? And so even in these rooms right now that we're creating, this coffee break is that you somewhat see, uh, you know, there's a little bit of tension of, of how much can I be authentic? How much can I be real? How much can I be messy in these rooms because of, of the presentation I have to carry in most of the rooms that we're in or most of the spaces we're leading in, right? Uh, the performance side that we need to, we need to always be on top on, you know, on the spotlight. And so I want to encourage you like, this room, this space is not one for performance or presentation. We're here to, to create a safe space uh, for you to be messy um, because that's where we see transformation happen. That's where um, that's where that's where we see confession happen and we see even deliverance happen. And so um, if you if there's any prayer requests, any prayer report, praise reports, we, I want to open it up and take this moment right now to 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 um to just see God move in this room. I see uh prayer requests from DJ pray 
pray for the Lord to bless our new lead pastor. Yep, Matt's a good friend, man. DJ, and I'm excited to get to know you and um, for sure praying for him and your congregation in the time of transition, especially for his family as as well as they, they move from, I think, Northern, Northern California. Oh, no, sorry, Northern L.A. Yeah, nor they're moving uh northern LA to northern San Diego. Yeah, yeah. It's huge a upgrade, transition. Though. Huge upgrade. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so keep for sure keeping him in prayer. Any other prayer requests? I tossed one out for some missionary friends of ours. We have in Oxford. Her name is Judy, just has discovered myeloma, a cancer very advanced, difficult, and she's uh, she loves Christ. Her husband loves Christ. Please pray for Judy. Yeah. All right. Any others? I put in the chat, uh, be praying for my mom <clears throat> and my uncle, uh, just attested positive of COVID. And so my mom went to the uh, emergency room for it a couple of nights ago. Oh, so I, I believe she's doing a little bit better. So I, I got to give her a call here in a little bit just to check on her, but be praying for both my mom and uncle. Yeah. Yeah, I would also um, ask if you guys can be praying for my uh, my brother in law has a big, big, big decision um, that would affect his family today. And so if you can keep him in prayer. I see another one in the chat, a friend, uh, Richard, sharing praise report. My friend had successful open heart surgery one month ago. Praise God for his recovery. He's doing good. Yep. Praise God for that. Thank God for that. Cool. If there isn't any others, we're going to go into time of prayer. Um, Elginon, I see you're on. Are you available to, to uh, close us out in prayer? Good morning, Kevin. Yes, sir. All right. Thank you, sir. Father God, we just thank you, Lord. We praise you. We give you the glory and the honor. We thank you, Lord God, for this time, Lord God, of sharpening this time, Lord God, of that will help us, God, in our ministries, in our churches. Lord God, I thank you, Lord God, that that which has been shared will not fall upon deaf ears, but Lord God, you will give us strategy to place these items into action, oh God, and we just thank you. We praise you and we give you the glory and the honor. We pray and lift up every request before you, those that are sick, God, those that, oh God, are dealing with conditions and ailments in their body, who have decisions, oh God, to make and, oh God, need your uh, clear and specific direction. Lord God, I pray that you would meet each of those individuals. Thank you. Lord God, we praise you and we give you the glory. We give you the honor. God, we pray that even now that you would, Lord God, breathe upon our ministries and our churches afresh. In the name of Jesus, Lord God, we pray that that which has been hard, God, that which has been a struggle, that which has been a strain, God, that you would touch it even now, Lord God, and help, oh God, every crooked place to be made straight. Lord God, we just thank you. We praise you. We give you the glory and the honor. In the name of Jesus, Lord, I pray that you would bless us in the days and the weeks to come. Help us not to feel, Lord God, like we are on an island by ourselves, Lord God. Send the help that we need, God. Let us know, God, that we are not alone, God. Help us, Lord God, to be, God, uh, assertive, God, and help us to be, Lord God, sure and confident, God, that you have called us, God, to this thing, and you will, oh God, help us and aid us, God, through it. And God, we just thank you. We praise you, and we give your name the glory. We give your name the honor. We give your name the praise. Go ahead of us this day. Let this be a great day. Let this be a great week. In the name of Jesus and God, we just thank you that your silence and the voice of the enemy. We thank you today that no weapon that is formed against us will prosper and that every tongue 
tongue that rises up, uh, up against us. Hallelujah. You, you will condemn. We just thank you. We praise you. And Lord, we give you the glory and the honor for it is so and so it is. In Jesus' name we pray and we thank you, Lord God, and we say amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you so much, Pastor El John. Um, guys, we're excited about what God is doing here through XP Gathering. Continue to stay engaged with us. Uh, we're praying for you, believing for God's good work this coming week, and continue to bless you guys and your ministry. Uh, we're of a resource. If you if you need to connect with us, we also have an ongoing uh, network, digital network through Mighty Network. We'll share some of those information on how to join our digital network throughout the week. And so you can be engaged with so many different conversations and resources that we're providing for you guys. Dennis Allen also has um, some content for us he, with his book, Discipleship Dilemma. We will be sharing a code to his book, the digital his digital version. Um, so you guys can have that as well as a resource for you. And please make sure you you follow him and follow what the work, the work he's doing there as well. And thank you so much, Dennis Allen, for joining us today and all the all the um leadership nuggets and challenges you've given us. Next uh next coffee break is coming up Monday, February. It's just posted in the chat. Thank you, Nikki. Uh February, Monday, February 12th. Make sure you put that in the calendar. Registration link has just been posted. Make sure you register. Invite others into this community. Um, you know, I think as ministry leaders, we're there's so much on our plate. There's so much that we're doing. Um, being sandwiched, especially if you're in the second chair, being sandwiched by the vision of the senior pastor and the staff and and um, being able to have a safe space where you're being supported and resourced and and find your wingman. I love that, Dennis Allen. Find, come and find your wingman here um, with XP Gathering. Again, thank you guys for joining us. We love you guys. We'll see you next coffee break or online February 12th and have a great week. God bless. <laughs>